All right, good morning, everybody. It is Monday, August 21st. It's now nine o'clock in the morning. We're ready to begin our Horse Heaven Wind Farm Day 4 hearings. We have a number of witnesses today uh, who will be providing confidential information in their testimony, so we're going to be in and out of closed records session as we need to be. Some parts of the day will be longer in closed session than others, but we'll just ask that you bear with us. We'll try to keep a slide up in the main room, letting you know our approximate times in and out of session. Before we get started any further, I'd like our staff to call the council roll so we know who's here today for the Horse Heaven Council. F Sec Chair. Kathleen Drew, present. Department of Commerce. Elizabeth Osborne, present. Department of Ecology. Eli Lloyd, present. Department of Fixed and Wildlife. Mike Livingston, present. Department of Natural Resources. Lenny Young, present. Utilities and Transportation Commission. Stacy Brewster, present. For the Horse Seven Project, Department of Agriculture. And Benton County. they'll be joining after that is everyone judge all right i'll ask that if we do go into closed session and our agriculture and county representative have not yet joined that staff look to move them into that closed session if at all possible yep. and i'll also ask if there's a background staff member that can email or reach out by phone to both of them to let them know uh what we'll be doing today so just that if they do come in while we're in closed session they realize they need to message somebody to identify they need to move into the closed session to hear the testimony. Council members, we're going to start today with Emily Ragsdale's testimony. She's sponsored by the applicant, so I'm going to do a quick roll call of the parties so you can see who's participating today. Uh, at that point, I think we'll be ready to call Ms. Ragsdale to testify. The general uh, process for today will be Ms. Ragsdale starting here at 9 o'clock. Perhaps by 1045, we'll be going into closed session with Jessica Lally's testimony. That will carry us as scheduled through the lunch hour. We'll have George Selim as the first witness after uh, Ms. Lally's completed and go on to two more additional witnesses this afternoon on cultural resource topical issues. Um, if you're still looking at your schedule that you received last week, I don't know if Ms. Mass Gales posted a new one yet, but there's an updated version for this week, and you'll see that Jerry Meninick, who you might have thought we were preparing for today, is going to be moved to later in the week. Um, Chair Drew, we've also come up with a time for Mr. Wiley's testimony that will be on the after, or sorry, in the morning of Wednesday this week on August 23rd. And Mr. Harper has proposed, and I think it's a good idea that we have a very limited redirect. Uh, from Ms. Cook. So we'll see how the scope of testimony goes with Mr. Wiley and Ms. Cook, I think, is planning to listen in. So she'll know what, if any, rebuttal testimony she needs to offer. Uh, Mr. Rambrew has proposed a witness. We don't have a name or a, any other identification yet, but if uh, appropriate, he's going to work with Mr. McMahon and the other parties to identify who that might be as a potential rebuttal witness as well from TCC. And if that works out within the scope of Mr. Wiley's testimony, uh, we'll see if Mr. McMahon wants to put any objections on the record and tomorrow or Wednesday's housekeeping session and what we do from there. So those are some other things to anticipate based on Chair Drew's questions. I had a good conversation with the parties Friday afternoon and relayed your specific questions. And I think they're essentially the same as what you had sent over to me that day. I might have changed the wording uh, slightly so we'll make sure uh, we know where we're going with those in general on Wednesday morning all right let me take the party roll for the applicant good morning your honor Ariel Stavitsky here for Scout Clean Energy I'll be um, handling the cultural witnesses today all right and for Benton County good morning your honor Ken Harper and Z Foster for Benton County Council for the Environment. Sarah Reinevald on behalf of Council for the Environment. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. And Yakima Nation. 
Good morning, Shona Volkers for Yakma Nation, along with Ethan Jones and Jessica Houston. And Tri-Cities Cares. Good morning, Your Honor and uh, Council Members. Uh, Rick Aramber representing Tri-City Cares. All right. Ms. Emily Ragsdale, good morning. I'm Judge Torum. Nice to meet you. Good morning. Our process, as you've heard, is going to be uh, some in open session today, and then we'll be moving to a closed record session. Um, Ms. Volkers, after some thought about trying to keep things open as long as possible, I'll have you let me know when the first question you think might raise any confidential information. And Ms. Ragsdale, if you think an answer is going to stray into something that's protected information, I think you're probably well aware of where things might be in that regard for your testimony. I'll ask you to say, I think I'm going to answer with confidential information and advise we need to go into closed record session. So Ms. Volkers probably knows which questions she's got in mind, but your answers may be a little broader than she's anticipating. So if the both of you would help me keep the sensitive and confidential information uh, limited to those who have signed our confidential agreements, that would be great. As I said earlier, for those members of the public, uh, we'll try to keep things open as much as possible. Uh, open government and open proceedings are in everybody's interest and we'll go from there. I see that Ed Brost has joined us for the record. Mr. Brost, can you hear us OK? Yes. All right, thank you. And has our agriculture representative joined us? All right, not yet. So Ms. Stavitsky, uh, I hope you were listening earlier. I'm going to ask you once I swear in Ms. Ragsdale. She's going to be adopting exhibits 1004 T and 1005. Once I've sworn her in to do that, I'll have you maybe give a quick overview of what her testimony is going to cover so that members of the public have an idea of the scope. Uh, just a couple sentences, and then we'll see when we go into closed record session. All right, Ms. Ragsdale, if you raise your right hand, do you, Emily Ragsdale, solemnly swear or affirm that all of your pre filed testimony? as included in exhibits 1004 T and 1005 and any answers you give today in the course of this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you, ma'am. So exhibit 1004 T and 1005 are now adopted and part of our record. They're admitted as evidence. Ms. Stavitsky, I'm going to go on mute on this end and let you introduce the witness and then turn her over to Ms. Volkers for uh, cross exam. Thank you, Your Honor. Hi, everyone. Ariel Stavitsky here for Scout Clean Energy. Um, we're joined today by Emily Ragsdale, who is an archaeologist with HRA, um, who produced the cultural resource reports uh, that underlie the project application in the application for site certification, the ASC. Um, Ms. Ragsdale will be testifying today about her research on the cultural resource reports and the content based on those reports that is in the ASC, and that section is 4.2.5.2. All right, thank you, Ms. Stavitsky. That I think orients the council members and members of the public. Ms. Volkers, your examination, which I think is scheduled to maybe take a half an hour, and then we'll come to Ms. Reineveld. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we might not need that whole time. Uh, good morning, Ms. Ragsdale. My name is Shona Volkers. I represent the Confederated Tribes and Bands of the Yakima Nation in this proceeding. I have a few questions today about your background and the scope of your research. Are you originally from the Pacific Northwest? No, I'm not. Where where did you grow up? I grew up mostly in Reno, Nevada, so Great Basin. And um, and looking at your resume, is it fair to say that you also didn't obtain any of your formal training in the Pacific Northwest? Uh, not my education, no. Okay. I did see as well, um, and this is exhibit uh, 1005, um, I did see as well in your resume that you've worked on multiple development projects the impact Yakima Nation's members and Yakima Nation's treaty reserve rights uh, aside from this project. But you've never been hired by Yakima Nation to conduct any professional research, correct? 
Correct. So you've only been representing developers, correct? Correct. Yes, or or um, federal agencies as well, and st probably state agencies too. But you know, we work for Bonneville Power, for example, a lot, who has lots of transmission projects in Yakima Nation lands. Okay, but it's also fair to say that you work for a number of developers. They're proposing industrial projects that impact the Yakima Nation, correct? Yes. And I saw on page two of your direct testimony, I believe exhibit 1004, um, that one of the reasons that you were engaged by the applicant to work on this project was to, I believe you said, quote, assist with tribal communications and outreach. Um, you haven't engaged directly with the Acquisitions Tribal Council regarding the project, have you? Nope, that was not my role. Okay. Do you believe that your company's report on the project's cultural resource impacts contains sufficient information regarding the project's potential impacts to Yakima Nation's traditional cultural properties? Um, our reports don't necessarily describe the impacts. The impacts are addressed in the um, application. Our reports are about the background research and the results of our investigations. Uh, so it's the documentation of archaeological and architectural uh, resources. But they so don't analyze the impact. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. They don't an analyze the impacts of the project, just provide recommendations for how to deal with the resources that are identified. And is it your opinion that they contain sufficient information about Yakima Nation's traditional cultural properties to fully inform the council? Oh, uh, that, that was not the scope of our reports. Okay. And is it your professional opinion that the application itself contains sufficient information regarding the project's potential impacts to Yakima Nation's traditional cultural properties to inform the council? That is outside the scope of my role on this project. Okay. Do you know what Yakima Nation's historic traditional use areas are? I am not an expert by any means, no. Do you know? Do you know anything though about the ethnographic history? No, yeah, yes. As the, in the course of our research, yes, we do cover that. So, would you say that the course of your research covers uh, sufficient information about where Yakima Nation's ancestors lived, hunted, and gathered? Yes. I mean, sufficient in terms of what we were trying to do for our report, not sufficient probably for a TCP analysis for the scope of what our work was, yes. Are you familiar with the historic kinship ties of the 14 tribes and bands that make up what is now the Confederate tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation? On a broad level, yes. What do you broadly know about the historic kinship ties of all 14 tribes and bands of the Yakima Nation? Broadly that they have existed for a time immemorial that people have been on the landscape. Um, my perspective is that I know about the archeology, span you know, the evidence that was left by those people. I am not an ethnographer. Um, I, I know what was written in literature that was produced at the time of contact up and through the historic period, but I'm by no means an expert on Yakima Nation history. And you didn't submit any rebuttal testimony in response to Jessica Lally's report regarding the project's potential impacts to Yakima Nation's TCPs or traditional cultural properties, correct? Correct. Can we agree that Jessica Lally's experience working for Yakima Nation and her ability to obtain information directly from Yakima Nation members makes her the most qualified archaeologist to provide a professional opinion regarding the project's impacts to Yakima Nation's TCPs? Absolutely. Those are all my questions at this time, Your Honor. All right, thank you. If we need to on follow up, the smokers, let me know if we need to go into closed session for anything. Um, 
please. We, we didn't have to yet. Ms. Reinevelt, you're scheduled for some questions as well. When yours are done, I'll go around the room for all the rest of the parties and then we'll come to the council uh, and see if Chair Drew and the council members have any questions for you, Ms. Ragsdale. Ms. Reinevelt. Good morning, Ms. Ragsdale. My name is Sarah Reineveld. I'm an Assistant Attorney General in the Environmental Protection Division of the Attorney General's Office, and I'm the Counsel for the Environment assigned to this matter, which represents the public and its interests in protecting the environment. And I have a few questions for you. So you are a Principal Archaeologist at Historic Research Associates, which provides cultural resourcing consulting services. Is that correct? Correct. And turning to your direct examination, your cultural resource credentials, including completing pre-contact and historic period archaeological surveys, research evaluation and data, archaeological monitoring, um, and also government and tribal communications, uh, correct, among other things. Correct. And for this project, you were first contracted to complete a desktop survey analysis of the project. Um, or a desktop analysis of the project, also conduct a limited field survey and assist with tribal communications and outreach. Is that correct? That is correct. And you prepared portions of the appendees, including Appendix R, cultural resource reports for the application for site certification, correct? Correct. And is your tribal communications and outreach for this project accurately summarized in Appendix R? Yes, summarized. Okay, and is there any additional relevant communication uh, that was particularly relevant to your survey results and the conclusions today that you had with the tribes? Uh, no, I, I think that the the tables that have all of the information, you know, they summarize all the communications that happened. You know, the the details of some of the earlier conversations aren't listed in those communication tables. Um, from the, you know, the first year of the project, but they're all summarized there. You are not a member of a federally, federally recognized tribe, correct? Correct. And you've never been a member, correct? Correct. You were also contacted to complete a desktop analysis for this project, correct? I don't, I don't know what you mean by desktop analysis, I suppose. Well, I was going to ask you what that entails. <laughs> <laughs> where is that language coming from, I guess? Um, I believe um, it is in uh, the description of, of what you performed in the project. So if you can't speak to that, then I can move on in my questioning. Well, yeah, I can tell you generally what a desktop analysis is. You know, it's, it's all the background research that goes into um, deciding what the possibility, the probability of their, what what types of resources are existing, known to exist in a landscape, um, and what types of resources could possibly exist, where they might be, how they might have been affected by um, landscape changes over the years. Um, it sort of helps inform your field methodologies. It provides a context for analyzing and interpreting resources. That's what a, a desktop analysis is. We didn't produce an actual um, product of a desktop analysis per se. That would have been all wrapped up in our cultural resource reports, but there wasn't like a standalone desktop analysis uh, document produced. Okay, but it's fair to say that you conducted one. And oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's all part of, that's sort of like first, second step of starting any sort of survey, archaeological survey. You also conducted a limited field survey, correct? Um, I wouldn't call it limited at this point. We surveyed 22,000 acres. Okay. Um, so you surveyed those 22,000 acres over five field sessions, is that correct? Um, I couldn't say the number of field sessions that would be listed in our reports. You know, it was over a two and a half year period. Um, so many, many field sessions, yes, with lots of crew members. Um, each field session is about 80 hours worth of work. So. Okay. And is it fair to say that all of the project area was not surveyed? There was an area of the project area you did not survey. Is that correct? 
Um, no, we surveyed, we didn't survey the lease boundary. We surveyed the micrositing corridor, which is where all mm -hmm. the impacts, the, the physical disturbances will be. Okay, and you didn't survey the lease boundary? Correct. And why was that? Because there will not be any physical impacts in the areas outside the areas where we have surveyed. And if there okay. are, we would survey those in the future. Gotcha. Um, so as part of the application, uh, as well as the appendix, you were required to identify historic and archeological sites within the areas of the facility that were are going to be affected by construction and operation. Is that correct? That is correct. And did you evaluate the resources identified for eligibility for listing in the National H Register of Historic Places? We did for the historic period archaeological sites and also for the built environment. Okay. And were there other sites that you did not identify? Not identify or not evaluate? Not evaluate. Not evaluate. Yes, there are two pre-contact archaeological sites that are not evaluated because that um, because of the regulatory context. Okay. Um, did you also give consideration to significant properties, specifically those listed in or eligible for the Washington Heritage Register? That is part of our analysis. Yes. Okay. And your survey results are summarized in the application, is that correct? Correct. Okay, and as a result of your survey, you identified 14 archeological resources and five historic properties in the area you surveyed, is that correct? That is not correct. Okay, can you uh, clarify the record then? Sure, we, we, we identified 41 archaeological resources. So that's 29 sites and 12 isolates. Okay. And of those, how many did you recommend be uh, avoided? All of them. All of them? That okay. were, I'm, I'm sorry, let me, re, re, let me go back on that. We, we recommend avoiding all of them. However, under state law, historic period archaeological resources that have been determined not eligible for the National Register do not require avoidance. So that was our answer in our reports. Okay. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that you did not evaluate all of them for the National Register, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and when does that evaluation process occur? Well, evaluation of historic period sites um, by its very nature is invasive. So we have to go into archeological sites and dig holes in them, which is a destructive process, right, in and of itself. So we don't necessarily we don't need to go down that right route and destroy more sites to sort portions of sites to determine eligibility if they're not going to be physically impacted. So we can just leave them as unevaluated uh, and avoid them. And that, you know, is in the spirit of preservation, essentially. So the only time we would go in and, and do that evaluation testing is if we think that there might be an impact. Um, so we did that for five of the resources. And then there's some other types of sites, you know, the historic period isolates that you can make an evaluation determination without doing that subsurface investigation. So there's a handful of those that we did that. There's some that we did some testing and then the rest are unevaluated with no plans to evaluate them unless they're going to be physically impacted. Okay. Um, and I believe that you might have reviewed well, you, you probably reviewed the updated application for site certification, correct? Correct. Okay. And did you also review what is being dubbed the Moon Memo, uh, which was a memo to Amy Moon titled Horse Heaven Wind Farm Anticipated Project Modifications for Final Application Certification? Um, are you familiar with that? I'm, I'm familiar with that. I received it just very recently. Um... I have, you know, I couldn't quote it by any means, but I do know of its existence, yes. <laughs> okay. 
And would it be fair to say that you don't know whether the current project, even with these modifications, will avoid these archaeological resources and the isolate that you identified? I have not reviewed it in detail now. So you don't know? I don't know. Okay. Um, and will there be a point in time where that determination regarding avoidance is made? Yes, but probably not by me. That was not my role in this project. Okay. And is it your understanding that the applicant's going to retain a qualified archaeologist kind of prior to the construction of this project? Yes. Okay. And that person is going to be responsible for preparing and implementing culture resource pre-construction pre surveys and avoidance plans. Is that correct? Uh, yes, though we do have a draft avoidance plan uh, written that HRA wrote, that I wrote. Okay. Um, and we mentioned tribal coordination, but is this plan going to be developed in coordination with the Yakima Nation and other tribes? Yep, and it says that right in the draft plan. And just because I'm not familiar with this process, is this plan also going to assess whether these sites can be avoided? No. It's going to list the sites and it's going to show how they are avoided. It's not going to assess if they will be. Okay. Um, and assuming that at least some of these sites cannot be avoided, what additional work would be necessary to determine the site's significance and integrity? Um, I guess it depends on what, what sites we're talking about here. Okay. Well, just hypothetically. <laughs> hypothetically, if it was a, a historic period archaeological site, we would, and it couldn't be avoided, we would, similar to the five sites that we have tested for the project, we would get a, a, an archaeological excavation permit from the DAP. Uh, we write a research design. That research design would be written in coordination with the consulting parties, the tribes, the DAP. Um, we would then do more research about that very specific location to see if we could get more information about that resource. We would go and do some formal testing excavations, you know, square formal holes to look at the stratigraphy of the site, collect the artifacts. We would do a laboratory analysis and then we would write a report that would make recommendations as to the site's um, eligibility for the National Register. Okay. I just have a few other questions. Um, Ms. Volker's Council to Yakima Nation asked you about the term traditional cultural property, correct? Correct. And are, are the traditional cultural properties, um, from your understanding, did you account for those? Or those were, are, are those reflected at all in your survey results? That is outside the scope of what HRA provides. We do mention the communications that I had with Jessica Lally about, um, but very limited, you know, I had very limited information and it is no noted in our report about a TCP uh, in one particular location. Do you agree that the criteria for a traditional cultural property can mirror basic National Register for historic places criteria? Uh, yeah, there's federal guidance on that <coughs> issue, excuse me. And do you agree that the traditional cultural properties of the tribe could be considered eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places? I would assume so, yes. I'm not an expert in TCPs, nor do I, you know, only Yakima Nation can say what is important and eligible to Yakima Nation. That's not something that I can do. Do you think it would be important to assess whether any of the traditional cultural properties were eligible for the National Register of Historic Places, particularly pertaining to this project? Absolutely, yeah. But you didn't do so, correct? That is not the scope of what HRA, the services that HRA provides, yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further questions. All right, Ms. Ragsdale, I'm gonna check with the other parties. And before I come back to Ms. Davitsky for any redirect, um, I have a question for you as well. Mr. Harper, any questions for Ms. Ragsdale? I All right, I'm seeing, 
Thank you, Mr. Arambaru. Any questions for Ms. Ragsdale? Mr. Rambrew, I didn't hear anything you might have said. All right, I'll come back to Mr. Rambrew. Uh, he may be stepped away or be having technical difficulties. Ms. Ragsdale, I'm looking at the application Exhibit R, and your conclusions and recommendations are on page 44 in the version that I've got. And so if I understand the scope of your testimony and the questions posed to you so far, as an archaeologist, you looked at the corridor for the transmission that's there, the corridor of the various um, proposed strings of turbines, and I, I trust also under anything that might be impacted permanently, the buildings uh, that would support the project, the battery energy storage facility that's proposed, as well as the solar arrays that are in the application. Is that the scope of the archaeology look as the footprint of those items? That is correct, um, but buffered. So the, the corridors that we surveyed were, were buffered, you know, in, in certain instances, they would be 400 feet wide, but the, the actual disturbances aren't going to be that wide. And that was to allow the project to have some wiggle room. So if we did find a resource, it would be easier to avoid. They could just move a line over or move a turbine over. Okay, so and, it, and, and the word no shovel probes meant that was just walked, the viewing was done, and you had another map of previously identified cultural properties that were significant on these lands. That is correct. It was all pedestrian survey. So we walk along transects spaced 20 meters apart and observe the ground surface. All right. And again, as you indicated in your answers and on this page, the summary, if when it goes to the actual excavation, there'll be the ar archaeologist on site looking for remains or other indicators of a cultural property that might not be readily visible from the surface? Um, well, I think that depends on on the results of the consultation and communications as it comes to the monitoring plan. Uh, the, I don't know if there will be an archaeologist during all excavations for the entire project. That remains to be seen. Right. And I think you said earlier you're not an ethnologist, but if this project was approved and the current routing of and, and placement of all the facilities is done, do you have an opinion as an archaeologist on the impact overall on the Yakima Nation, um, on what the project would do on the scope and scale of it as to any impact on archaeological resources or anything beyond on cultural practices and resources on the land? It is my understanding that there have been several TCPs identified in the project area and that um, viewshed is a very important part of that and that the landscape itself where the project is going to be built is going to adversely impact that. Beyond that, I can't really say much about the TCPs. Um, and that's just from what I've read, you know, from Jessica Lally's most recent testimony. I'm not really privy to that information. Um, in terms of the archaeological resources, we have five resources that have some sort of pre-contact component, um, and those are all being, are the, the, there's three sites and two isolates, um, and I, I don't know if you're familiar, an isolate is a single artifact, and a site is more than one artifact and or features, so some more permanent um, cultural material on the ground, like um, a building foundation would be a feature, for instance. Um, and those are being avoided. The three sites, as far as I know, are being avoided by the project. There'll be no physical impacts to them. Uh, and then the isolates are not protected in any way under state law. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if those will be avoided or not, but we would come up with a plan with uh, the tribes to determine what they would like to happen with those two isolates. And final question, to the best of your knowledge, Will any of the access for tribal members to these TCPs or isolates included be impacted at all by the construction of the project as proposed? I would assume, well, without, I, I guess I can't say because I don't know the boundaries of where these TCPs are. I haven't seen that. But you're not aware of any alteration of existing access rights? Correct. Ms. Davitsky, I'm going to come to you for any redirect. 
And after that, go around to the council members and then we'll see if there's any recross. Ms. Volkers from you, from Ms. Reineveld, and then also Mr. Harper. And if Mr. Rambrew is back with us, I'll come back to him as well. Ms. Tavitsky, I'm going to mute on this end. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. If, could I request a five minute break just to collect my notes and make sure I have my redirect questions done? Sure. Would, uh, well, before I do that, would it help you for me to ask the council members at this point if they have questions that might also help you redirect? Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. Right. Chair Drew has her hand up, so I'm going to go to Chair Drew first. Thank you, um, Your Honor. Ms. Ragsdale, so uh, what I hear you saying is that your charge was to look at the ground below uh, what might be um, affected or impacted in the construction of the project. Um, but you didn't look at how the construction of that project might affect other traditional cultural properties that may be in the region. Is that correct? That's correct. That is not within the scope of our work. Okay, thank you. Other council members questions at this point for Ms. Ragsdale? Stacy Brewster, if you'll introduce yourself uh, to Ms. Ragsdale so she knows uh, what agency you work for and then pose your question. Hello, Ms. Ragsdale. My name is Stacy Brewster and I'm a representative for the Utilities and Transportation Commission. I'm wondering, can you talk a little bit about what avoidance means? Is there specific parameters? Is sure, yeah. Um... Avoidance means comp no ground disturbing actions whatsoever within a buffer of a resource boundary. So right now we have a draft avoidance plan um, and there's some suggested buffers in there, but of course that is up to um, change, you know, it could be changed depending on what sort of feedback we get on it. Um, so generally we have, you know, a, a, a 20 meter buffer on the boundary of sites resources that should be av avoided. Um, so in practice, that would mean, you know, archaeologists going out ahead of time during construction or right before construction and physically staking off these buffered areas so that construction personnel can't enter into them. Uh, and then monitoring during construction to make sure that construction personnel stay out of these sensitive areas. Thank you. I see Eli Levitt has a hand up. If you'll introduce yourself. Then we'll Hi, Ms. Uh, my name is Eli Levitt. I'm a section manager at the Washington Department of Ecology and Ecology's FSAC council member. Um, I believe your testimony yeah. references <laughs> that you got uh, yeah. feedback from three, three tribes. Can you briefly characterize at a high level what kind of feedback you received? Um. We, well, we had conversations early on with um, as many tribal member or tribal representatives from the cultural resource departments that that would that would talk with us. Um, you know, gave them introductions to the project. Um, I definitely received initial feedback from um, representatives of, of Yakima Nation um, and the CTUIR. Um, the Nez Perce gave us some information and. Um, but mostly specifically, I would say it would be in response to so anytime we would write a report, we've written six reports at this point for this project. And anytime we have a draft report, we would send it around for review to solicit comments and edits and feedback. And then we would take those and, and make edits that went into our final final draft. So I would say that's probably the biggest portion of, of comments we received. OK, thank you. Council members, any other questions before we take a break before redirect examination of Ms. Ragsdale? All right, I'm happy to tell all of you also that we're making great headway. This might be a good time. Um, I think Ms. Lally is already on the call, Ms. Volkers. Uh, so maybe you want to check with her and make sure she's ready to go sooner. I think we'll, I anticipate we'll be done well ahead of the 1045 schedule. Um, we can call her sooner and continue to make good progress today. All right, everybody, it's 9.39. Let's go ahead and take 10 minutes till 9.50, and we'll come back then, Ms. Davitsky, with your redirect of Ms. Ragsdale. Thanks, all.
All right, everyone, we're ready to come back with Ms. Ragsdale's testimony. We'll have some redirect as needed from Ms. Davitsky. Looking to see if uh, it looks like everybody is back. Ms. Davitsky, why don't we go ahead? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Ragsdale, for being here today and answering all of these questions. Um, first, I want to address um, you got a few questions asking about your experience as an archaeologist and with your familiarity um, studying and working with tribal issues. Um, I wanted to give you another chance to describe. Can you describe for us your experience working with tribes and um, your familiarity with tribally sensitive resources? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every every project that we work on, we try to coordinate to the best of our ability with tribes. Um, tribes have a very unique and important voice in archaeology, and we would seek to incorporate that whenever we can. Um, often there are things that, that tribes uh, are don't want to share with us, and that's perfectly fine. That's definitely within their rights, you know. So we just can take the information um, that is provided to us and incorporate that to the best of our abilities. So generally, when you know when when we're starting a project, we try and reach out to um, cultural resource programs that different tribes have, you know, communicate with them, hey, we have a project coming up. We wanted to let you know about it. We wanted we're seeking your input. Uh, do you have any concerns? Do you have any information you can share? Uh, we always try and uh, offer, and we did for this project, you know, the opportunity to come out and meet us in the field, um, to share perspective, or just to get a sense of what the project is about. Um, we offer the opportunity for tribal members to monitor our work. Um, a, a, any tribe can always, always, always send a tribal monitor to come out and, and physically watch what we are doing and the decisions that we're making in the field. Um, We've also on this project um, offered to subcontract to tribal members from these cultural resource programs and in fact did so with the C2IR. Um, you know, they staff, they actually provided staff members to be uh, archaeological technicians on some of the early surveys for the project. Um, and then try and communicate about the results in our reports. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, we send out reports um, to solicit feedback. Um, and then try and incorporate those comments that we received into the, the final product. Um, and that's just, I guess that's just sort of like the general philosophy for, for all projects um, that, that we do here in the Pacific Northwest. Great, thank you. So you mentioned, you know, there's this connection between your archaeological work and traditional cultural properties, TCPs. And some of the questions got a little bit there, but I want to make sure everybody sort of understands those categories and how they relate. So can you explain, you know, what archaeological resources are and what TCPs are and the differences and how those two relate to each other? Sure. So archaeological resources are, are generally defined anything that's older than 50 years old. That's the physical remnant of people being on the landscape, right? So that can be a historic period which here in the Pacific Northwest in this region, you know, goes back to about, I guess, 1805, with Lewis and Clark coming through, right? The, the first colonialists that came into the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then prior to that, we generally call pre-contact archaeology. Um, so it's, again, it's the physical remnants that we find on the ground. And that can be artifacts, that can be features, that can be um, midden deposits, it can be faunal remains, it can be all sorts of things. Um, TCPs, on the other hand, which again, I'm not an expert in, but we they, they are intertwined, of course. You know, it's, it's a, a place or a property that's associated with cultural practices and ideas. It's... Um, rooted in the history of a, an, a group of, of people and it's an, it's integral to their cultural identity today. Um, and it can be, as I'm sure we'll get into once we get into Jessica Lally's testimony, um, a, a wide array of features and aspects of the natural world um, of which archaeology is one portion of. So we might have an archaeological site that is part of a bigger TCP that contributes to the significance of that TCP. 
Uh, I imagine that there might be some instances when an archaeological site itself could be a TCP. I mean, I'm not familiar with any of those. That's, that is the TCP itself, you know. Um, but archaeology is one aspect of it, I suppose you could say. Okay. So if I'm understanding you, your answer, some archaeological resources are also part of TCPs. And can, some... Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And some TCPs can also be part of archaeological resources. Is that accurate? Sure. And I would say that TCPs don't have to include any archaeology, is my understanding. Okay. So we, let's see. So you testified that strictly analyzing TCPs was not part of the scope of your archaeological analysis in your cultural resource reports. But were there any TCP relevant, was there any TCP relevant information discussed with you or that you considered during your evaluation of the archaeological resources in play? Absolutely. I mean, one of the very first conversations I had uh, was with Jessica Lally, and she mentioned to me that a particular resource um, was associated with it. I'm sorry, Ms. Roggs, I'm really sorry to interrupt. I just want to make clear, too, that I, none of my questions are going to require disclosure of confidentiality. And so we don't need to discuss what the resources are, if any, just to flag that for you. So I'm sorry. Sure. Um, OK. You she did mention question? a TCP. <laughs> yes, she did. She did mention a TCP to me immediately. And I brought that right back to Scout immediately. So there there was and that that is mentioned in our report as well. OK, so is that the inf the the TCP information that was disclosed to you by Jessica Lolly is included and addressed in your reports. Is that accurate? It is mentioned in our reports, but it is not analyzed. That was not with the scope of the project. But hey, like, hey, there's this thing that needs to be considered uh, okay. in a, a different context than the archaeological report. So within the FSEC standard framework that was informing the structure of your reports, that information from Yakima Nation was considered um, under this, the applicable standards. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see, you mentioned in a couple of your responses that nothing in state or federal law necessarily protects archaeological resources or TCPs, but you mentioned um, that there is a need for a DAP disturbance permit if those resources are going to be disturbed. Can you clarify these resources may not necessarily be protected, but what is the regulatory framework that applies to them? Well, as you probably are aware, you know, the FSEC standards don't define uh, historic or archaeological sites. They just say, come up with a list of these sites and then talk about impacts and talk about mitigation. Uh, so we really have to rely on state law in this regard. Um, an archaeological site is, is a very big definition. Um, uh, you know, it's basically, it contains archaeological objects. And then there's another section that tells you what an archaeological uh, object is, you know, and that goes back to that physical evidence of, a pre, of, a, of people on the landscape. Um, but there's also other uh, revised Code of Washington uh, that defines archaeological resources um, and doesn't define pre-contact pre or prehistoric resources, but does define historic period resources. Um, so that's sort of the, the framework that we're, we're working within. Okay. So then under right. that... Oh, sorry, I didn't answer the second half of your question, which was what are, the, are they protected or not? So um, revised Code of Washington, uh, I guess it's 2753, states that you need a permit to disturb, a permit from the DAP to disturb an archaeological site. But when you get into what is an archaeological or an archaeological resource, it covers all pre-contact resources and it covers historic period resources that are eligible for the National Register. So there's sort of a split in uh, Washington state law about what a resource is, if it's pre-contact or if it's historic period. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily protect that. It protects them in the sense that you can't disturb them without a permit. Understood. So then 
how are TCPs typically treated under that framework? And really what I'm asking is how are TCPs typically addressed and treated in a project planning context like the one we're, we're in now? I was going to say it really depends on what the, the context is. If you're in a federal process, there's pretty uh, well-defined methods for it. In the state process, it's, it's less uh, defined. Um, there is a policy memorandum where the DAP defines what a TCP is, um, and that sort of speaks to how I described a TCP earlier. Um, and I guess it just falls into this pot of historic and archaeological resources, but it's not well defined, I would say. Okay. Then I'd like to move on to talking more about the outreach you performed and the coordination that you engaged in with the tribes. Um, you mentioned that there were offers for studies and that you engaged with the CTUIR and her, the court reporter, that's the uh, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Um, so did any of the tribes take you up on the offer to conduct those studies? Yeah, so that was actually really early on in the project based on the initial feedback that we had, you know, the initial conversations right out of the gate, like I mentioned earlier, we were hearing um, feedback right away that they're, they're were TCPs or potential TCPs in the project vicinity. I brought that back to Scout and Scout immediately said, let's offer to have some TCP studies. Let's offer all of the tribes who are interested to have a TCP study and we'll fund that and we can work with them directly to make sure that any info that they will only share information that they feel comfortable with, understanding that this is highly confidential and really sensitive cultural information. Um, so we, uh, you know, within the first month of working on the project, we we uh, the HRA that I worked on the project were, were made those offers um, both informally over the phone and then in a, we sent out a letter. Um, and like you said, the CTUIR uh, decided that they would like to conduct a study, and they did conduct a study. Um, and we've been working with them. They working with them in terms of um, they conducted the study. They provided us the executive summary of the study because it was, like I said, confidential information that they didn't want to share, which is great. Um, and then we've been working with them on a, a resulting mitigation agreement for the impacts to the TCPs that they identified. Okay. And was there funding associated with funding offers associated with those? Yeah, with absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Um. Okay, Ms. Wilkers asked you about um, your engagement with the Tribal Council, and you testified that you hadn't d talked with the Tribal Council. Who did you speak with during your work with the Yakima Nation? Uh, Jessica Lally. Well, my very first call was to Johnson Maninik, Um, and I spoke with him a couple of times, and then he he referred me to Jessica, and then after that, it was, it was Jessica. Okay, and who is Johnson Maninik? He is the former head of their cultural resource program. Okay. Uh, so you testified that um, you had received feedback from Yakima Nation from Jessica Lally on your draft cultural resource reports. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And did you incorporate that feedback into the report? Yes. Yes. Um, Let's see, have you read um, Jessica Lally's testimony as part of this adjudication, her direct testimony and her uh, report? I'll call it a report. I have, yeah. Okay. Um, and again, I'm not asking about the content of that report, but I just want to ask, um, did you read specifically the information that's at pages 16 through 18 of, of her report that discuss um, sensitive sites to the Yakima Nation? Yes. Had you seen that information before? No. Okay, so it wasn't provided to you when you were circulating your reports and asking for feedback? No. Okay. Um, let's see, you talked about, uh, Ms. Reineveld asked you about the Moon Memo or the um, 
memo that's been circulated that discusses some proposed recent changes to the project uh, layout. And she asked you about whether that impacted, might impact the avoidance plan. Um, and I heard you testify, I think that you weren't aware if there would be changes or hadn't fully analyzed that. Um, are you, do you have any information to suggest that the changes proposed in the Moon Memo would cause the disturbance of certain um, archeological resources? No, it's my understanding that that the changes are actually a reduction in impacts. So uh, the, the footprint has gotten smaller. So if anything, it would uh, move project elements away from resources, um, not, not changes that would lead to more impacts. Okay. Um, and the avoidance plan that you discussed earlier, that you explained that HRA prepared um, and that will apply moving forward, would that avoidance plan apply to the project footprint ultimately, whatever it ends up being? Yeah, it's just a draft at this point. You know, we didn't even put, you know, site locations or anything in it because things are in flux, you know. But once everything is decided and once we've gotten feedback from all of the parties that are noted in the plan, then it would um, outline the details of exactly the specific locations that need monitoring, things like that. Okay. And let's see, you've mentioned DAP a couple of times. I want to clarify um, for the court reporter again, for the record, that's the Washington Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Is that right? That's correct. It's where the State Historic Preservation Officer is housed, okay. the State SHPO. And can you explain what's DAP's role in this FSEC permitting process? Sure. So DAP offers um, has a, a, several different roles. You know, a, a primary role is um, guidance, interpretation of uh, state law and their own regulations, their own guidance that they put out for conducting archaeological surveys, standards and such. Um, they're also they also um, house all of the site resource forms, cultural resource forms and reports that are produced in the state. So they're where we go to get um, all of our background research of what sites have been identified on the landscape, where er what areas have been surveyed. Um, and then they act as the uh, agency that reviews reports that either concurs with determinations or recommendations, depending on what regulatory context we're in. So in this case, you know, we made recommendations about uh, eligibility in certain cases and or um, uh, suggestions about avoidance, things like that. So they review all of our reports uh, and then provided concurrence on said reports. Um, and then if the project moves into, um, I don't know exactly how this will apply for, for this, but they, they in general, I guess that I would say that they are um, signatories on agreement documents for mitigation. So if there's a memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of agreement, they would be somebody who, uh, a party that would be a signatory to that. So they help uh, with the consultation process, I guess, in determining uh, how to resolve impacts. Okay. So if, if the, I'll call it the sensitive site information that's in the in Jessica Lally's report, if that had been submitted to DAP, would you release it to you to release it to you for study and to be discussed in your reports? If all no, it there's sort of two levels of information that's provided to DAP. In DAP. So it's a, it's a confidential database that you have to have certain qualifications as an archaeologist to have access to. But then there's another level of it that's even more restricted that holds TCP information that that the only people that can access that are the people um, who have been given permission by the, the folks who submitted the TCP information. And the TCP information often doesn't make it to DAP anyways because it's it's so confidential. Okay. So I would have had, I don't know if they have it, and I wouldn't have had access to it. Okay, so it's, am I understanding correctly that in order, if if it had been submitted to DAP, in order for DAP to release it to you, to include in your studies, the, the 
Yakima Nation would have had to provide express approval. That's correct. Um, and did you submit your reports to DAP? Yep. Okay. Did DAP concur with your findings? Yes, they concurred with every recommendation we made as, as it relates to archaeology. And Okay. Um, no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Ragsdale. All right, let me come back to Ms. Volkers from the Yakima Nation and then to Council for the Environment. Ms. Volkers. Thank you, Your Honor. I do have a clarifying question. Um, Ms. Ragsdale, you were just talking a little while ago um, with Ms. Savitsky about, uh, I'll use the term intersection, the intersection between archaeological um, resources and traditional cultural properties. Um, isn't it, and you also talked about how DAP defines a TCP or how you consider a TCP, but isn't it true, and I believe, didn't you say earlier um, that it's your professional opinion that only tribes can define and identify their own traditional cultural properties? Yeah, absolutely. And why is that? Can you help it, help the council understand why that's your opinion? Well, I mean, because I am not an expert and anybody who is outside a culture is not an expert on what's important to them. I don't know about the traditions. I don't know about um, why things contribute to their cultural identity because I'm not them, right? And so would it also be necessary then to defer to the tribal knowledge on when there might be an intersection between an archaeological resource that you identify and a traditional cultural property that their members hold? Yep, and that's exactly why our report is written how our report is, is noting that certain resources have been identified as potentially being associated with a TCP, but not delving into any further analysis because that's not my analysis to make. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions at this time. Thank you. Ms. Reineveld, any follow up? I just have a follow up uh, based on, I believe, some of the questions you posed, um, Judge. Um, Ms. Regsdale, you were asked some questions about shovel probing, I believe, and as part of your survey results, uh, or as part of the survey process, did you recommend any locations within the surveyed area for shovel probing? No, we did not. And that's based on uh, the ground surface visibility and the depositional environment of the project area. Uh, surveying, you know, as you might imagine, archeological survey in general is a, is, a, is a sampling strategy, right? It's all about sampling. No, no survey is 100%. It's all about you know, spacing of your transects or whatever. Um, so the large majority of the survey is in agricultural fields, which had very good visib surface visibility, but also have the benefit of um, being tilled. So it's turning up the top, you know, 30, 40, 50 centimeters of soil, which is giving you way, 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 way more visibility to what's happening in the subsurface than you could ever hopeful, hope to get with a, any sort of systematic shovel probing. Is it fair to say um, that it's possible that there could be buried cultural deposits, even with the conditions that you mentioned? Uh, I would say that's fair to say about any archaeological survey ever. OK, and do you intend to conduct any shovel probing? No. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. All right, Mr. Harper, that raise any questions the county wants to pose? No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harper and Mr. Rambo. I see you're back. Did, do you have any questions for this witness? Uh, I, I do not. And um, we are um, coordinating with the Yakima Nation concerning these issues. So it is unlikely that I will have questions of the witnesses today just to alert you and and the other parties. So um, uh, so if I don't respond, um, it's not it's not for lack of interest, but we don't have any questions these witnesses. 
All right, thanks, Mr. Rambra. I just want to extend the courtesy in case something comes up that might touch on TCC's overlapping interests. Okay, thank All you. Right, let me come back to Chair Drew and the Council, Ms. Ragsdale, and then we may be able to release you. Any other questions from Chair Drew or the Council members? All right, seeing none. Thank you very much, Ms. Ragsdale. Appreciate all of uh, your testimony today. I wanted to ask the parties, were there any cross exhibits that I might have missed uh, posed for Ms. Ragsdale that need to be considered for admission? I didn't think there were any. At least none mentioned. All right, thank you, Ms. Ragsdale. Thank you. Ms. Volkers, are we ready to swear in uh, Ms. Lally and get started with her testimony and sort out when we might take a break from there? Um, we are, Your Honor. I did have a procedural uh, request to make first before we move off of Ms. Ragsdale's testimony. Um, the Appendix R was not shared directly with the parties um, and is not available publicly online. And so while I believe that we do have um, everything that you are looking at, uh, I would ask that FSEC staff send the totality of Appendix R to all the parties. I'm sorry, we're hearing a little bit of interference, Ms. Volker. So can you, you're asking simply that Appendix R to the application be submitted to the parties? Yes, Your Honor, it does not not yet happened. All right, yeah, that Appendix R was simply part of the original application for site certification that's been on file on the FSEX website. Uh, there's a redacted version that's on the public website since February 8th of 2021 or thereabouts. So that's just commonly known materials. It's uh, something the council's already reviewed as part of both its SEPA review and in preparation for today. It doesn't need to be made an exhibit. It's already essentially part of the council's application review record. So I'm not sure if you, it's not going to be marked as an exhibit okay. or separately admitted. Your Honor, if I may respectfully um, highlight that it's not available on the website anymore. I know that it was at a time and it's been removed. And so my request is yes, not that we make this necessarily a formal exhibit that she needs to to adopt, but that we all have the same copy of Appendix R that FSEC and the council is looking at as they make their deliberations so that we are citing to the same uh, document. All right, I'll have Ms. Uh, Massengale email back and forth with me uh, as opposed to including all the parties so we can make sure that the version I was looking at is posted at least for council and party review, if not necessarily an exhibit. Thanks, Ms. Volkers. I didn't realize you weren't able to find that on the website at this time. All right. Good morning, Ms. Lally. I'm Judge Torum. How are you? Good morning. I'm well. All right. I was looking at your background and see you spent some time in Ellensburg, where I near, now live and worked with some of my KidCom folks that I deal with in some of my pro tem judging. So another Ellensburg Wildcat, welcome on the screen. I'll swear you in and we're going to have you adopt your testimony today. My understanding is exhibits 4001T. Uh, there's a revised version of that. 4003 revised, that's confidential. And there will be a number of cross exam exhibits that are introduced during the course of questioning today. Um, Ms. Volkers, is there a 4002 that I'm yes. not identifying? Yes, Your Honor. There's an exhibit 4002. All right, thank you. So, council members, those would be found on. I just didn't put that in my notes, Ms. Volkers, but I do have it up on my screen here. So, Ms. Lally, I'm going to swear you in, have you adopt those items. Then I'm going to let Ms. Volkers uh, make a quick summary of the areas you'll be covering. We may be going into closed session due to the confidential nature of a number of the things you'll be testifying to. So Ms. Volkers will identify, uh, or perhaps the ones asking the cross-examination questions will identify when they're going to go that route. But if there's any answer you intend to give that we haven't already moved in the closed session that you think we should, I leave it at your discretion to bring that to my attention and staff, and we'll pause and go into closed record session uh, until it's designated appropriate to come out if we're going to cover things that are no longer confidential or sensitive 
we'll keep things as open and transparent for members of the public that are listening in as possible, but certainly uh, let's be conservative in what we protect in the discussion of cultural resources. Ms. Lally, with that, any questions for me? Uh, no, Your Honor. All right, so court reporter is going to be taking down everything that's said, so speaking a little slower and more deliberate and making that attempt not to talk over each other is appreciated. I didn't mention that to the other witness. We got a little bit fast at times, so take that into consideration as well. All right, Ms. Lally, if you'll raise your right hand. Do you, Jessica Lally, solemnly swear or affirm that all the testimony you filed previously in Exhibits 4001, 4002, and 4003, and any answers you'll give in the course of questions today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. All right, thank you. So then I'll note for Ms. Massengale to mark that 4001, 4002, and 4003 have been adopted or now admitted as part of our record. Ms. Volkers, if you'll give a quick introduction to this witness to set the scene, and then we'll move on for questioning uh, by the applicant and come back to you for any follow up. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Lally is a professional archaeologist uh, currently employed by the Act Nation Cultural Resource Program, and uh, the bulk of her testimony uh, is with, with regard to um, what is Exhibit 4003, which is a traditional cultural property study. Um, and I will I'll ask her if clarify exactly what that is. I do have a few questions that I can ask before we go into closed session, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Lally, um, to clarify, I want to ask you, there's a statement um, in applicant's pre-hearing brief, and then there was also some inference, I think, this morning about whether or not Yakima Nation uh, declined applicants' invitations to conduct a study of their traditional cultural property. Can you please answer whether or not the Yakima Nation declined to conduct a traditional cultural property study? Yes. yes. I, I Um, the the issue of the traditional cultural property study was really an issue of confidentiality and disclosure. I did conduct a traditional cultural property study, but it was done confidentially in house and um, unfunded by the applicant. Okay, and I'm going to ask Judge Torm, are you hearing us clearly? I'm having a little bit of a connection issue. I don't know if it's me or or not. Ms. Grantham is indicating it might be on your end, so it might be helpful if you mute between question and answer. Um, oh. They want to re-ask that question simply because court reporter indicated part of uh, Ms. Lally's answer was garbled. Okay, Ms. Lally, um, the question was whether or not Yakima Nation declined applicants invitation to conduct a study of the Yakima Nation's traditional cultural properties. Can you clarify that please? Yes, I can. Um, I did complete a traditional cultural property study. Uh, we did that in house um, on our own time. It was. Um, we did not take the applicant's offer uh, because the information is confidential. I did not want to disclose it. And how long um, would you say that it, this uh, study took? It took a better part of a year, um, the better part of a year. Even though you already had some some information um, that was held by the by your program before you began this specific study, correct? Yes, that's correct. the The information that I am presenting has been um, collected and documented over the course of many years at Yakima Nation through through various studies. Can you talk a little more generally about how long these studies usually take and why? Traditional cultural property studies um, generally take um, about a year to do. Um, and that is because um, the information that we're gathering is complex. 
Um, it's also because it's uh, highly sensitive. Some of this information takes uh, a great amount of time to identify people we might want to interview um, and really delve into the issues at hand um, that a particular project may be affecting. Um, there's a significant amount of archival research um, that goes into compiling this level of documentation as, as well as those interviews. Your Honor, I would ask that we go into closed session before we um, move further. All right, for members of the public, we're moving into areas that are confidential and only disclosable in the course of the proceeding for those that are on the council, making the, the recommendation to the governor and or folks that have been designated as experts by other parties and all parties that have signed their confidentiality agreements. So apologies for leaving you if you're paying attention today. Um, Ms. Lally's testimony on for a period of time during the cross for a period of time during the cross examination by the applicant that's been designated for up to an hour and redirect, which will probably happen after lunch by the Yakima Nation's attorneys. So it's now 1026. I'm going to project that we might be back around 1130. There may be some periods of time uh, that the applicant will let us know if we can come back and share the testimony with the public. All right, I'll ask staff to now move us into the closed session. And your honor, the Yakima Nation's Tribal Council is on a separate um, log in. I think they're identified pretty clearly at, at this point so that they can be moved over as well, please. All right. When we get over there, Ms. Volkers. Good, uh, good morning. This is Judge Torum. It's now 1135 a.m. We've been in a confidential closed record session since approximately 1015, 1020, somewhere in that neck of the woods. So for the last hour and a quarter, the council has been hearing confidential and sensitive testimony uh, from the tribe's archaeologist, a uh, Ms. Jessica Lally. We're now completed with a first round of questions, and the council's going to come back for some additional closed record testimony. Uh, at 1250, we'll open the session again here in the public session and then be immediately be moving into closed record session for those that have signed the confidentiality agreements or are otherwise participating as council members or staff. Thank you for your patience as we do this closed record testimony. After lunch today, we have three additional witnesses, uh, George Selim, Terry Heemsa Sr., and Casey McWallahy. It's anticipated that some or all of their testimony will also be necessary to be taken in a closed record session. We'll put up the appropriate slide that tells you what's going on and keeps you apprised. Thank you. We're going to adjourn for lunch. We'll be back at 1250. All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is Judge Torum bringing us back into the Horse Heaven Wind Farm adjudication. This is day four. We're coming back from a lunch break into the public session, and shortly we'll be going back into closed record session for additional questions for Jessica Lally. Uh, Ms. Volkers, anything before we go back into that session? Thank you. Yes, Your Honor. I am uh, sorry to inform you, but I learned that one of our witnesses this afternoon, Councilman Wallace, he is still at services for his brother who passed, so he is not available this afternoon to testify. Well, understandable, and I appreciate the heads up. And he is listed for 2.55 p.m. to 3.25, so we'll see what we can do to reschedule um, based on the family schedule, I would imagine, as you informed me last Friday afternoon that there were some other issues. Um, I didn't realize that, that who was involved, but I appreciate you sharing that today, clarifying. I'll let you work with the other parties based on the grieving schedule for that family and any other customary needs. Uh, and we'll, we'll see what can be done to get Councilmember Wallahi, uh, Councilman Wallahi back in front of the 
members when he's ready. Thank you, Your Honor, and I, I will continue to, to update the parties as I am aware of rescheduling opportunities, um, but I, I also did confirm with Mr. Maninik that he is out at least for the next few days for um, his own uh, attendance at a service. A separate separate service, I believe. OK, please keep us posted and we'll inform the whole EPSEC staff and council members as we go forward uh, with the updated schedules. Um, any other party have anything we need to put on the open record before we go back into closed session? Seeing no hands other than Ms. Volker's, yours is still electronically up there. There we go. OK, members of the public, if you were hoping to hear testimony this afternoon, um, we're really just going to be in and out of closed session, mainly taking confidential and sensitive uh, information by testimony today. Uh, we've got Jessica Lally, and then we also have two other witnesses who both have a, a number of items of confidential testimony. When we're done with Ms. Lally's testimony in closed record session, we will come back out to swear in George Selim, and we'll also be swearing in Terry Heemsaw Sr. Those adoptions of their testimony will be done in public session, and some of the questioning might occur where everybody uh, that's interested today can hear the questions and answers, but as soon as uh, we get into any confidential or sensitive information, we're going to defer back to closed record session, and that's what we're going to do now. So uh, for those members of the public, we'll post probably a sign that says we'll be back in 30 to 60 minutes to take uh, Mr. Selim and swear him in. He's scheduled for 145. It may be earlier. Thank you. Staff will move us over, please. All right, looks like we're back into the open session. We just completed the testimony of Jessica Lally. We're going to take a break until about 1.20 and then come back into the public session where you'll get a chance to see George Salam, S-E-L-A-M is the spelling of the last name, adopt his testimony, which if you have it accessible is exhibit 4005T. Uh, we likely will go back into closed record session uh, for cross-examination of Mr. Salam and any other follow-up questions. So members of the public, uh, we're going to be on break until 1.20 and we'll come back and you'll get a chance to be introduced to the next witness. And as much as we can make public, we will. Thank you. We'll take a recess till 1.20. All right, welcome back everybody. We're still on day four of our Horse Heaven Wind Farm adjudication. We're going to take up the remaining two witnesses for today. Uh, hopefully I'm going to pronounce the name that I've been cued. We have, is it George Salam? Yes. All right, thank you. I, I think I was pronouncing it. I know I was pronouncing it wrong earlier, so I'm <laughs> glad to have been corrected. Members of the public, we're going to swear in this next witness, George Salam and uh, Shauna Volkers, Shauna Volkers, the attorney for the Yakima Nation will give us a brief overview of what he'll be testifying to. I believe there's one Mr. Salam exhibit uh, 4005T is how we've uh, got it mentioned here today. And we'll, I'll have you adopt that and swear that it'll be true and any other uh, answers you give today. If and when Ms. Volkers or you feel that we're going to stray into anything that's confidential or sensitive, please don't answer the question until we can move into the closed record session. Only the uh, council members and those that have signed the appropriate confidentiality agreements will be permitted again into that electronic closed hearing. So for members of the public uh, to have an idea, we've got about a half hour of pre-planned testimony or, or sorry, cross-exam 
or follow up redirect time with Mr. Salam. Uh, Ms. Volkers, I think you've got the bulk of that time. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Um, applicants say that they were not going, or I, I believe we're not planning to cross exam. So we request this time for Mr. Salam to speak on um, his supplemental testimony that was not appropriate for inclusion in written form. Okay, great. That helps clarify for the council members where we're going. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to swear you in, Mr. Salam, and then we'll see how far we get before we go into closed record. If you'll okay. raise your right hand, sir. Do you, uh, George Salam, solemnly swear or affirm that all testimony you'll provide by adopting Exhibit 4005T and any answers you provide to questions from Ms. Volkers or any other parties or council members will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I will show that Exhibit 4005T has been adopted and is now admitted to the record. Ms. Volkers? Thank you, Your Honor. I am going to ask that we go into closed session at this time. Okay, so we're going to go into some very sensitive and confidential information, members of the public. I'll ask those on the line to stand by, and if you are admitted to the uh, previous closed record session, we'll expect to see you on the other side here as well. All right, we're back in the public uh, portion of the hearing. We've just finished the testimony and examination uh, from George Salam from the Yakima Nation tribe. It was nice heartfelt testimony from a tribal member adding to the perspective the council needs to consider as we go forward with the application review and this adjudication. Uh, for those members of the public that couldn't hear this testimony due to its sensitive nature, both culturally and uh, archaeologically in so many other ways. I, I would just encourage uh, any further study of the local First Nations, if you will, that are in your area and to educate yourselves. The, the council's been given a thorough, better understanding than we might have had just from paper. So I thank Mr. Salam again for his testimony and only wish it could be shared with more people. We're going to take a break before we have one additional witness today, Terry Himsa Sr. And I apologize in advance. I have a feeling this testimony will have similar impact on us personally, uh, but we, again, most of it will be in private. You'll be introduced to Mr. Himsa at about 2.15 today. He'll adopt his testimony and we'll go into the uh, closed record session shortly thereafter. And that'll be our last witness for the day. We'll come back out to talk about the schedule for tomorrow and the rest of the week and adjourn for the day. So we'll take a brief recess until sure. two fifteen. Ms. Volkers, I'm so sorry to interrupt, Governor. I just um I know we're scheduled for two fifteen. Given that this is our last witness of the day, I'm gonna ask for a few more minutes for myself personally and ask if we could come back at two twenty. Sold. Done. <laughs> two twenty. We're at recess. We are back for what promises to be one of our last sessions of the day. Uh, we're in a public session right now in the Horse Heaven Wind Farm adjudication. We completed all of the witness testimony for today, except that of Terry Himsa Sr. We're going to adopt his testimony here. I believe it's exhibit 4006T. And I'm waiting to see him come up on my screen. Good afternoon. Are you Mr. Himsa? Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Adam Torum. I'm the administrative law judge helping the Energy Siting Council with this adjudicative proceeding. Sir, what we're going to do is uh, have you take the oath of witness and adopt your testimony. And Ms. Volkers will then uh, let us know when we're ready to go into closed session. It may be pretty promptly. 
and members of the public while we're in closed session we'll be hearing from Mr. Kimsa, one of the Yakima Nation elders and there are confidential and sensitive materials that he'll be testifying about but definitely providing the energy siting council uh, and the other parties the information they need to help process this adjudication forward over the coming weeks and months. Uh, Ms. Volkers, anything else you want me to go over before I swear in this witness? Not this time, thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Heems, again, good afternoon. We do have a court reporter taking everything down that's said in English. I understand you may also speak in your language. So if you will, at those times, uh, speak slowly and uh, well enough that the council members can hear you. And if there are any words in the native language that have a, a spelling in English, as I've learned from the last witness, that will help the court reporter tremendously. And Ms. Volkers, you may get an email about some spellings to suggest so that the transcript uh, reflects everything in a respectful manner. All right, Mr. Himsa, if you'll raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Do you, Terry Himsa, Sr., solemnly swear or affirm that all testimony you'll provide, including that contained in Exhibit 4007T, your pre-filed testimony, and all answers to questions posed today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I'll turn you over to Ms. Volkers. When she's done with her questions, I'll survey the other attorneys for the other parties and then the chair and the council members to ask questions as well. And as uh, I may have some questions as well. So Ms. Volkers, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I am going to ask that we go into closed session. All right, so members of the public, it looks like the entirety of this testimony will likely be sensitive and confidential. Uh, we'll post an indication that we may be back at at or around three o'clock into public session to close out today's proceedings. So uh, be on the lookout for that in the next 20 to 40 minutes when we'll be coming back, but I would anticipate no later than three o'clock. I might be wrong, but look for us then. Staff, please move us into closed session. Um, really quick, Lisa messaged me saying that the wrong exhibit number was stated. It should be 4006. Correct. The exhibit, if I misspoke, is 4006 that's been adopted. Okay, now I'll move over. And are we there going? I'm going. All right, we're back in the public session. We've completed our witness testimony for today. We heard from Council Elder and Council Tribal Member Terry Himsa in some, again, more heartfelt and very personal testimony that needed to be kept on a confidential and sensitive closed record hearing. We have one other witness that needs to be rescheduled, and I'll be waiting to hear from Ms. Volkers as to when uh, Kasimak Wallahi might be available that witness is in a time of grief and we want to respect that. So we're not going to take that testimony today. Council members, as shown on your schedule, that will be moved over to another date later this week. Tomorrow, we have a testimony starting at 9 o'clock with a series of witnesses, one from the applicant, Andrew Lyons, and many from the Tri-Cities Cares, Jim Sanders, Kurt Keelish, Linda Lehman, Richard Hagar, Carl Dye and Fire Chief Lonnie Click. None of the parties have questions for those witnesses, but in order to admit their testimony, as you saw one day last week, we'll be calling those witnesses, giving them an opportunity to adopt their testimony and present them for questions to Chair Drew, yourself and the council members. Tonight, please go ahead and review those testimonies. We want to avoid, given the waning number of days we have left, any recall like we're doing with Mr. Wiley on Wednesday, but we'll have less and less time if we have witnesses that we adopt their testimony and later witnesses raise questions. But I'll ask council members to pay special attention with that in mind, and we'll see if it can be done in less than the hour and a half allotted. And if we can get to the Jansen and Romig testimonies uh, 
before lunch and certainly finish up with Ms. Or with the Romick testimony as close to or earlier than 445 tomorrow. So it'll be anticipated to be a full day on Tuesday. Wednesday recognize we do have the public comment hearing scheduled to begin at 530. The Tri-City Herald has been making clear they published a clarification today that I was able to read and share with FSEC staff, uh, reminding people that if they've made any public comment on the application prior to the end of business on January 31st of this year, they're eligible according to statute to still provide public comment on Wednesday evening. There was some confusion last week, I think very unintentional with the link to the council members or council's website, and it seemed as though we were artificially limiting comment. That should have been clarified now for the public. I don't know if we have a number yet, but Lisa Massengale may be able to tell me the number of folks that are currently signed up. We're scheduled to go from 5.30 p.m. Wednesday night until around 8 o'clock. I don't know. It depends on the number of people, whether they'll have two minutes or three minutes or some other uh, period of time. It'll, I want to accommodate as many and as possible every single person from the community or otherwise who wants to comment. So um, if they filed a previous written comment, we're going to see if they want to elaborate on that on Wednesday night, but I want to make sure you're rested for that as well. With that in mind, if you look at the Wednesday schedule, we're starting again at 9 o'clock and trying to fit in quite a number of things. That schedule still a little bit in flux. Um, it looks like we may go as late as 245, but I'm hoping council will be efficient and we'll continue along the way of finishing a bit early as we have several other days this week. So hopefully you'll have enough time to get some sustenance and maybe a little bit of rest. Uh, give your brain a rest from the adjudication between Wednesday's hearing and the public comment hearing. I'm not even going to guess what the impacts on Thursday or Friday's schedule are for you. Uh, they'll continue to develop, particularly Friday, and we're going to make sure we get all the testimony in for you. I may have an update for you tomorrow morning as to the number of uh, public commenters seeking to be signed up for Wednesday. Chair Drew, do you have any questions as to where we are going forward? OK, council members, any questions that need to be answered today before I let you go? OK, I'm not seeing any. Uh, let me go around the room to the parties. I see Mr. Arambu, I'll come to you first. Uh, see if there's any questions going forward, uh, particularly if the council members need to hear it. If not, we can stay on in a housekeeping session. Um, the testimony of Mr. Sanders that he was to um, affirm tomorrow uh, will be withdrawn. OK, thank you for that. Does the applicant have anything else for today? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Tavitsky. Mr. Harper? Nothing, Your Honor, thank you. And Ms. Reinevelt? I don't have anything other than I do have a hard stop tomorrow at 445. So hopefully if we need to carry over any wildlife testimony, we can. OK, thanks for letting me know that. We'll manage accordingly. Thank you. And Ms. Vol Ms. Volkers, anything else for the record today? Nothing else today. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, everybody, have a great afternoon. It's 3.05 p.m. We're adjourned for the day.